You know what, this song, uh, when uh, a DJ one day said, it was in the 70s, he said, uh, this is the last song that Diana Rose is going to have with the Supremes. Oh, uh, we nearly cried. You know, I, I, I imagined how the Supremes or Diana Rose was going to be on her own, and the song had become something that we were we, we, we really, I mean, the Supremes themselves, the songs that they sang, and to, to hear them sing this song, someday we'll be together, and they are parting, it really affected us. <clears throat> but then what happened with my friends, whenever we were parting, we'll say, someday we'll be together. And um, this song was actually talking to me, that someday I'll be here. <laughs> It's, 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 you know, it's very emotional for me um, because um, Motown raised us. When we were growing up in the 70s, um, we looked up to Motown musicians. So, as I said that this song was saying, someday we'll be together. It was singing to me. You know, I went to um, the Motown uh, Museum um, I think a day before yesterday. Before that, we passed by with, with, with Chido, and Chido said, yes, the Motown uh, Museum, let's stop. I said, please don't, I'm shaking, I want to cry. Because it had become an identity for us in the township. You know, you know when you are at the lower end of the social ladder, you want um, idols to look up to, and Motown was that to us. So um, someday we are together. Uh, what do you make of this, um, Marvin? Well, you know, Motown, Motown music was especially important. Well, it's uh, part of the reason why it was especially important to black people mm -hmm. is that uh, it gave such a good representation of who we were. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it started for, for us in the late 50s and the 60s, and that music was a part of uh, our freedom struggle, just as it was in Zim. You know, that, that music that, that showed us uh, black people as a valuable commodity, appreciated, you know, loved in the society. Motown music is still very important mm -hmm. to American culture you know, very important to American culture. But, um, you know, as a young person growing up in, in college and through the civil rights era and the black power era, that music spoke to us uh, culturally. Uh, the best of it spoke to us spiritually, you know, because mm -hmm. it was music uh, buying about black people who loved each other. You know, we didn't rag each other out in the music. You know what I'm saying? We. These were songs of love and self-reflection. You know, Temptations had a wonderful song uh, that Paul Williams used to sing uh, called Check Yourself. Mm. You know, it, and not brag and, you know, be boisterous and so forth, but check yourself. Look at your relationship to people. Uh, that's a part of what uh, Motown did, but it also spoke to us economically. Mm -hmm. Black home, black business, okay? Mm. Dreamed up by... Uh, uh, a black man, Barry Gordy, and, and finance with his family, Esther Gordy, his sister. I mean, all of those things meant so much to a people on the move. Okay? Mm. Black people represented as we saw ourselves and not stereotypically. Mm. Okay? Black, about, black people as subject, not object. Okay? <laughs> Talking about checking yourself, uh, in our culture, you have to thank people before you and greet them. So <laughs> I'm checking myself. I want to thank uh, all those who have made it possible for me to be here, uh, the University of Michigan, uh, Zimbabwe Cultural Center, Detroit CCD, Njelele Art Station in Harare, Christina Hamilton, uh, Chido Johnson, uh, Dana Wabira, uh, Scott Creech, uh, uh, all those uh, people at Michigan University. And I want to greet you all. Um, in our Shona culture, we say Kazwai, 
can you say this? And men go like this. Kazwai. Kazwari. And in, in, in Devele, which is your Zulu, we say Salwanan. Salwanan. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. I want to talk, and I want to, to, to thank, um, I'm so honored to have uh, my brother here, Melvin uh, Peters, Dr. Melvin Peters, who is a researcher, a scholar, um, an academic uh, in, in the African studies and African-American studies. I'm really honored to be here with you to share the same podium uh, and humbled, actually. <laughs> People that know me said, who is she talking about? <laughs> <laughs> honored and humbled, but, but uh, the honor is to uh, our guest here, okay? mm -hmm. Joyce Jinji McWinder. Um, She's a rare commodity as, a, as a, a woman musicologist. Her book, Zimbabwe Township Music, okay? her second book, uh, Black mu uh, Women Musicians in Zimbabwe, Women Struggle for, what's the proper title? Uh, uh, for voice artistic and artistic expression. And, and artistic expression. Mm -hmm. uh, both these titles, you know, as you'll see with the discussion, uh, speak to the parallels between uh, Motown okay, mm -hmm. and black people in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. But I'm honored to be with you. Thank you so much. Good. Let me just um, take you through my journey um, and my background with Motown musician music. Um, coming here for me is like coming back in time. It's a sentimental journey. My child dream. Uh, you know, we lived Motown, as I've said. We, 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 we it was our life. And um, as a teenager, I, I, I grew up listening to sound, to, to music from Motown. And uh, people like Diana Rose, Marvin Gaye, the Jackson Five, um, Four Tops, The Temptations. I will tell you a story about uh, The Temptations. Um, <laughs> there was a, 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 a guy in the township called Sam. Um, when he played The Temptations, this is how this music affected us. When he played The Temptations, you know, we had those stereos. He would take um, the um, speakers, the those big speakers, and put them on a tree and, and shout and say, can you hear this song? <laughs> and we would shout and say, yes! You know, and it would play for 11 minutes. You know, it, 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 it was something, and up to now, these sounds are playing in our head. You can play it in the same Zimbabwe didn't start with us. That relation between uh, um, African Americans and us Africans in, the, in, in Africa, it started way, way long back in the 30s. Actually, I belong to the third generation of earlier Ben settlers who came into the township in 1931. When I'm saying township, I'm talking about places where black people lived. So when they came into the township, the, in, into the city, they had to stay. Um, it, it was a segregated society, so they had to stay in the township for black people. So um, many people in the region also came to work in Zimbabwe because there were opportunities for them around the region, especially during the Federation of Rhodesia and Yasaland. So in 1931, when my grandparents came, they were, there was no entertainment for black people, and they had to create their own. But there was uh, a loudspeaker which would be put in, in, in the township. And that loudspeaker, at 11, at 10 up to 11, it would play jazz music. And black people would listen to jazz music. And they fell in love with it. And also the stories that they heard that, oh, this is being sung by African Americans. And they, they, they shared the same um, background of um, them being uprooted from their traditional homes and coming to work in a cold place where you are not, uh, where you are discriminated, 
uh, because of your color, and, the, and, and African Americans were also, uh, also came from, a, 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 from Africa and were displaced from their traditional homes. So it was the same background. So they connected through the music, and also they connected through the culture, that, the African culture. Mm -hmm. So the relationship that we had with Motown was a continuation from that. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up uh, during the rock, pop, and soul era. I have yet that pop and soul is called R&B. <laughs> but I'm still stuck in that old <laughs> ways of calling it pop and soul. And my children laugh at me. Even, you know, when I talk about disco, they say, no, mama, it's now house music. And I say, but it's disco music. <laughs> So I was into pop and soul, and my father was into jazz music. Of course, my father came into the township when he was six months old, and he grew up in the township. He was born in 1931, and in the 50s, when our music really reached its peak, he was part of, um, of that music. Because it is my father who told me stories about the township and jazz music. You know, in, our, in, in my uh, home, jazz would be played at f as from 5 a.m. <laughs> you know, I know jazz as if I grew up here. <laughs> 5 a.m. But uh, when I grew up, I also want, I, 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 I fell in love with my music of that era, rock, pop, and soul. And, um, my father used to play his music and sit by the gate. I still remember one day I was going to watch a movie. And I said to my father, I want to go to, 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 to the bioscope. We call them bioscope. And he said, oh. And I said, can I have money, you know? And uh, he said to me, he looked at me, he said, have you finished dressing? And I said, yes. You know, I was putting on a top which came up to here. The whole stomach was out and the mini skirt, I couldn't even bend and um, platform shoes and an afro. And I said, yes, I finished dressing. I'm waiting for you to give me money. And he, <laughs> and he pulled out two dollars because he had been complaining about my rock music as well, uh, asking me whether it was not hurting my ears. You know, my, my father was very diplomatic. He wouldn't say this is bad. No, 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 no. He had ways of, of telling you. So he, he pulled out two dollars and he said, you know, during our time, we used to, to listen to good music, <laughs> you know, for two and six. <laughs> oh, and then he would talk about this time, and then when he finished, to, and, and then he would say, we'll sit for five hours. And I said, you didn't dance? And he said, no, you know, I said, but we dance, you know. And then he gives you the, five, the two dollars. But he has told you that his music was two and six, and it was good music. So he was referring to my, 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 the music that we used to listen to. But when I start, when, when he heard me singing Diana Rose, um, Gladys Knight, you know, uh, he would say, oh yeah, this child is normal. And you know, I'm one of the lucky people who was encouraged to, 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 to be a musician when I grow up. And he would say, you know, when he had me sing uh, Diana Ross, he would encourage me. Why he encouraged me to sing those songs, they, they, represented, they represented pride. They represented um, uh, hope, you know, the, just to know that uh, there was someone in the United States who is a black person who is owning a record label. It was just something for us. But now going back to, 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 to the 50s, uh, where I say the, 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 the relation started. Um, in the 50s, Louis Armstrong, in 1960, Louis Armstrong, because of that jazz connection, he came to Harare. Um, he came to, 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 to even to Lawai. But he didn't go to South Africa because there was um, the race relations were really bad in South Africa. This was during the, the, the Federation of Rhodesia and Yassan, and so Louis Armstrong couldn't go to South Africa because of apartheid. Not that in, 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 in Rhodesia it was not there, but it was so subtle uh, during the Federation of Rhodesia and Yassan. The, Rhodesia, the, the Federation of Rhodesia and Yassan was allowed by the British to try and improve race relations, but then, um, 
it, it was supposed to be a policy of partnership between black and white, but it ended up being a policy of a donkey and a rider. You know, people always call it that. But uh, they pretended that everything was okay. And Louis Armstrong agreed to those terms to come to Africa, to, 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 to southern Rhodesia. It was not even Rhodesia then. It was southern Rhodesia. Because there were two Rhodesias then. There was northern Rhodesia, which is now Zambia, and there was um, Nyasaland. People from South Africa yet to come and watch him. Uh, when he came, he had um, done a version of um, Skokian um, by uh, August Msarurwa. So this, this is the video which was taken um, when Louis Armstrong... There was a big turnout at Salisbury Airport to welcome Louis Armstrong, the king of jazz, popularly known as Suchman. As he stepped down from the plane, he was greeted by Mr. Samkange and other officials. Forty artists, including Mr. Augustin Sarurwa, the composer of the famous hit tune Skokian, were present to welcome him. The reception committee were already in the mood. A special attraction for the group. He, he chased those uh, minstrels who had come to watch his show, who had come to welcome him at the airport. But um, I think um, Melvin is going to explain more on the minstrels. But this is the day that Louis Armstrong came to Harare. As you can see, they are black and white people. It seems a very united uh, society. Can we play Skokiana by August Saruwa? <laughs> came to Zimbabwe because um, there was a, 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 a jazz, a, 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 a big following, a jazz following in Zimbabwe. And we even had what we called Jazz Appreciation Club. I was not there, but in the 50s, <laughs> there was a Jazz Appreciation Club at the Interracial Society, which was led by Aileen Adon. And they asked the United States Information Services to bring them a jazz musician. And they were asked, which one do you want? They said, Louis Armstrong. And um, a, a friend of mine, he's passed away now, uh, Paul Brickhill. Paul Brickle, actually, the father, wrote letters to Louis Armstrong, mm. and he still has the letters and they, you know, for him to come to Zimbabwe. When he came to Zimbabwe, from the airport he was playing this song, Skokiana. You, you might be asking what Skokiana is. Skokiana is a one-day broom, uh, which really makes you drunk. And this brew was, uh, came about because uh, black people were not allowed to drink clear beer, um, the bottled beer. And, but then they had their traditional beer, which they would brew, which was seven days. And they were not allowed to do that as well. And then if they wanted to do that, sometimes they wouldn't sit to, fresh, to, 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 to the end because the police would come and throw it away. So they came up with this one day 
brew, which was very dangerous because the way it fermented in a day, and yet it was supposed to take seven days, there was a lot of whatever they would put, they, <laughs> the, the substances they put were very dangerous, and the, 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 the authorities would arrest you if you were caught brewing that beer. But August and Sarur were in defiance. He composed Skokian, and his was instrumental. But Louis Armstrong's one, it was, it had words. Because maybe August didn't really want to be <laughs> open. But when <laughs> Louis Armstrong came, he even said, Skokian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he even he said, Skoki, Skoki. I wish we could get to where the words are. You know, and he said, uh, Whoa, happy, happy Africa. Take me back there. Far, far away from Africa. And then he said, Skokian. And he really celebrates, you know, the, 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 this illegal brew. So <laughs> this is, you know, music. Uh, was used to really um, to, 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 as a, a tool for resistance, to, 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 to challenge the status quo. And, um, and uh, right now, 60 musicians all over the world have done their version of Skokian. And they all, some of them, James Last sings the lyrics, Skokian, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, Yuma Segela will play Yuma Segela later. But the other thing that Louis Armstrong did while he was in Zimbabwe is to advise August Msarurwa. This was a brotherly, you know, relationship uh, which was really displayed by um, uh, Louis Armstrong, where he advised August Msarurwa to, 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 to watch out for his royalties. Yeah. And even advised him to, 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 to join the Inter International Music Association. Today, August Msarurwa is one of the mostly highly paid musicians. There are two of them. The one who did The Lion Sleeps Tonight and August Msarurwa, the exchange. You know, they are the mostly highly paid um, musicians in, in, in Africa. And it was, for August Msarurwa, it was because of Louis Armstrong. So maybe, we, we, can we get to where the, he does um, the lyrics? That's part of the reason Armstrong was called, he's called Pops because he was people's father. Yes. You want to celebrate Skokiana here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's celebrate Skokian. <laughs> Zimbabwe, there were also other musicians who were there besides um, August Sarurwa. As I said, uh, jazz music, jazz music was 
used a, a later, later, later um, on the musicians in Zimbabwe used jazz music as a fusion. At first they would sing jazz as it was. And then as time went on, they fused it with their traditional music. And then it became township jazz. So there were quite a number of, uh, of musicians who were around, um, who, were play, who, were, who were influenced by jazz music. I can play you another song by, um, by um, Dorot Masugu. Dorot Masugu actually is, the one, is one of the musicians who wrote uh, music for Miriam Makeba. A, a, like a, a, quite a number of songs that he wrote for Miriam Akeba. So he sang Imali Ami Pelele Shabin. Again, Shabins were places where music was played and Skokiana was brewed and they were illegal places. But he, she also celebrated um, the Shabins. So I will play you uh, Dorot Masugu, Imali Ami Pelele Shabin. to Motown, um, the relationship between Motown and Zimbabwe. Um, I just wanted to give a background of where it came from, that it, it, it was always there it, during the early urban culture. But maybe before I do that, um, um, Melvin, maybe you would want to talk about um, jazz here in, 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 um, in America. How did you look at um, Africa? Well, you know, um, Louis Armstrong, of course, is extremely important um, uh, to jazz music. Okay? Uh, the Africanness of not just Louis Armstrong's appearance, but the Africanness of black music coming out of New Orleans, uh, collective improvisation, stunning solos, uh, uh, evocative interpretive vocals. Um, it, I think it's Baba Maul that said, every beat of the drum is the sound of Africa. Uh, but jazz music was African music played by blacks in the West. Right? Polyrhythmic techniques, uh, call and response, uh, uh, harmonic techniques, um, and music of resistance. You know, one of the most important songs of the 1920s was uh, Andy Rossoff, who's uh, an African from Madagascar. He wrote the lyrics to What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue that Louis Armstrong took all over the world. Okay? When, uh, when Armstrong was in Africa, before he went to Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. uh, the first place he landed was in Ghana. Okay? Just as Bob Marley and the Whalers played at Zimbabwe's independence ceremonies, it was Louis Armstrong's band that played at Ghana's independence ceremony in 1957. Uh, Kwame Nkrumah went to school here in the States. Okay? You know, he knew Armstrong's music from there. Uh, uh, there's film of uh, Pops Armstrong singing, What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue in Ghana? And you see the Osaji for you see Kwame Nkrumah with tears in his eyes. Okay? And every Ghanaian in the audience uh, mouthing the words, you know, and the, and funny, the British people standing up there with their stiff upper lip, you know, <laughs> trying to look like they got nothing to do with this, <laughs> you know, all this business about causing so, so, black so pain. So that relationship. Yeah, and, really and it was, it's loaded with uh, political intrigue because uh, 
1960, Armstrong, before he went to uh, Zimbabwe, uh, he was in Congo, okay? This is uh, at, as they were planning to take out Patrice Lumumba. Armstrong was in Congo, okay? He was in Ghana. The United States in those days was trying to replace French uh, and British uh, influence in Africa, okay? And they were contradictorily uh, uh, trying to say with black music, with jazz and blues artists, see how cool we are with black people? You know, uh, Armstrong had to put his foot down uh, and make President Eisenhower and these people respond to the civil rights crisis before he would even go, okay? Uh, but jazz was that, that kind of music, you know? It was, in the 1920s, jazz was the popular music, okay? It was the, it was the Motown of the 1920s, that's the, that's the black thing that uh, stunned and charmed the world, okay? And it was, like all black music, you know, the relationship, as you said earlier, the, the relationship between uh, music in Southern Africa and the United States really uh, precedes the recording industry. You know, uh, black music can be subversive, and Afrikaners in South Africa uh, uh, contracted black Americans to come into South, Southern Africa to teach the African spirituals, okay, you know, uh, conned into thinking that the spirituals were, uh, uh, you know, cowed songs, okay. But uh, a black man with the faded name of Orpheus McAdoo uh, came to South Africa, yeah, his parents knew what he had. Uh, uh, <laughs> But he, was, he went into South Africa uh, and into Zimbabwe uh -huh. and taught uh, black music. His band was called McAdoo's Minstrels. They came to teach uh, uh, church music, but they, church, they, they taught all of it. Okay? And the recording industry started in 1920 in the United States. Did we have women during that time? When the jazz era started, uh, uh, the biggest stars were women. Okay, black women. Uh, by the end of the 20s, they had maneuvered most of these people out the way, okay? But Bessie Smith, Clara Smith, Mamie Smith, uh, Ethel Waters, okay? Uh, there's a black, and these black women sang assertive songs. You know what I mean? They didn't sing that saving my love, saving it all for you, baby, you know? <laughs> uh, Bessie Smith sang, you know, uh, I don't play no second fiddle. I'm used to singing lead. So they powerful yeah, women. I'm used to playing lead. And women, of course, <laughs> love this. You know, Bestie sang these songs about smoking reefer and, and drinking moonshine liquor and chasing these brown skins down, okay? Uh, and a woman like Victoria Spivey, who was a great left-handed guitar player and blues singer, uh, and uh, a strong ownership woman, okay? Victoria Spivey had her own record company in Chicago, okay? A lot of people know who Bob Dylan is. Didn't he just win the Nobel Peace Prize or something like that? The, f the first person to record Bob Dylan was Victoria Spivey in Chicago. Wow. Everybody else said, that dude can't sing. You know? <laughs> Vicky said, but listen to what he's saying, okay? But yeah, uh, so right, so in the, in the beginning, that was, that, was the, that was the status, you know? And, uh, and there's more to say about the Motown thing, but you know, women, like you describe women's struggle in the United States, you know, women struggle uh, with sexism in a sexist world. Yes. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and in Zimbabwe, there were quite a number of women in the, in, in the 30s, 50s, who were also following um, women who were singing here, like Ella Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. and quite a number of women. Women like Laina Mataka, women like uh, Evelyn Juba. So there, there were also women who were uh, doing the same that women were doing here. It's very interesting that we had women who were well, like that. People in, in, uh, in the music industry, uh, in, in popular culture in the United States, a lot of people have problems with women showing their intellect. I think you it's know? all over. So they like that, you know, they like that hot girl, you know, music, you know, that kind of sexualized female image, uh, but in, in the world of the arts, in jazz and so forth, they're like windows of opportunity where people break through, like Dorothy Masuka, yes. uh, Miriam Makeba. I mean, they were known for bringing intellect. Oh, yeah. And, and at the same time, uh, the message song in the United States came about 
because of the female voice. I'm talking about Nina Simone mm -hmm. okay? and, and all her they African came to ness. Zimbabwe. I mean, and Nina broke wide, you know, uh, uh, and made men, as we say, man up, mm -hmm. you know, and stop and stop singing these pimping and playing songs, you know, and getting mm -hmm. down to, to serious business. But that's mm -hmm. Nina Simone, you know, she's she's the first. Okay, mm -hmm. she's the first, uh, and they tortured her for that. For okay? mm -hmm. He came to Zimbabwe actually, Nina Simons, and wanted to buy a farm. Mm -hmm. And when she came back, she passed away. Right. When, when Nina, just quickly, when Nina passed, she had her ashes spread over the African continent. Wow, yeah, that's, that's good. That's how black she was. Yeah. I wish I had seen her, but when she came, I don't know what I was doing. I couldn't uh, attend your show. Um, I, I think we, 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 need, we, we can go back to Motown since it was, as I said, I was just giving a background. Um, and uh, you have seen that the relationship between Africa and African Americans has always been there. Um, you know, when I was coming to, 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 um, to, to, to the U.S. To, 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 to give this talk, Motown in Zimbabwe, I talked to some friends. And I said, I'm going to Motown. You know, they wished <laughs> they could come with me. And, they say, and I said, say, what do you think about Motown? And uh, one who is in South Africa, Louis Mlanga, he said, I am Motown. <laughs> and I asked my other friend in the UK, and I said, what do you think about Motown? And she said, you are going to weigh everything started. And I asked another one again, and she said, I wanted to play harmonica like Steve Wonder and sing like Ray Charles, and my main man was Levi Stubbs, lead singer of the Four Tops. Mm -hmm. My music was and is still a mixture of Motown and Marabi. We will play Fungai Malianga's song. And my other friend, Mike Mwale, a music archivist, Vinyl said, I personally, as an African from the motherland, came to understand more about my fellow black African Americans in America because of the impact of their music on my very Africanness. It was very touching. And African pride it produced in me. It was like their success was my success since their identity was my identity. In short, I view Motown as my own project. This is how we felt about Motown. That's why <laughs> when I went to Motown, I, I couldn't, I tried to fight my tears, but they just, I started crying. You know, I, you know, I was taken back, as I said, uh, we, 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 we wanted, uh, we looked up to, 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 to Motown musicians. They brought a lot of pride to us as youth in the township. And um, we, we, we had hope that we could also do it. For, for people like me, I've always been in music. And to see a black person here having such, I mean, a, such a powerful position in the music industry by having a recording company, by having musicians that were produced by Motown, we said to ourselves, we can also do it. Mm -hmm. And what um, Barry God did, I don't even think he knows the impact of what he did. He taught us that music and arts in general can be you can look at them as serious business. You know, people look at music and us as just past, past time. Um, you know, it's not like a serious thing that you can do in your life. But then, uh, Barry God brought that, um, while we were talking about black power, black consciousness, you also took that to a certain level of looking at our music at black, as black, black people as serious business. And some of the musicians that he produced um, are doing very well. That actually showed us that we can also do the same. And some of the people who grew up with me, they are also still musicians and they, uh, music for, for, for them is their life, which means that they, they, they look at it not just as art, but also as, 
as, as business, as something that they can live from. And, um, you know, we, all, we learned that from um, very God. I want to, while we were listening to, 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 to uh, more time music, some of us, of course, would just mimic <laughs> the songs. But um, we also came up with our pop. <coughs> This is one of the musicians who was very much in the 70s, who was inspired by um, Motown music. And what you must also realize is that all of us who were inspired by Motown, who were around during the Motown um, era, we were also inspired by jazz. Our parents were coming from the jazz um, mu music era. So you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll find that the music is a little bit of jazz, a little bit of pop and soul. Um, and also, what I wanted to say before I started coughing is, while we listened to, to Motown music and mimicked it sometimes, we also came with our own um, pop and soul. Uh, that music was talking about a place where Chido comes from. Maybe you can explain to them. There are a lot of mountains in, in, in Mtare. And the, the, the guy was saying, I, I, I went up to, to, to the mountains without even a ladder. And Chido loves this song because it, it comes mm -hmm. from Tari. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the other song that also became popular at that time, as I said, we were also coming up with our own music. It's called Jobek Bound. Jobek Bound for me is a little bit um, similar to The Temptations. Maybe you can play Jobek Bound. <coughs> Motown was very popular uh, in Zimbabwe, to, and in 2011, uh, Rep Theatre celebrated 50 years of Tamla Motown record label. You can see how we viewed Motown, how we were part of Motown, that even if in, it, it had stopped in 2011, we celebrated the 50 years of Motown music. And um, I, I, I think... Um, I, I, I will sort of end here and, and, and um, Melvin can take over before I close to say my closing room. I mean, what, I would, what I'm proposing 
uh, is a way to keep this memory of more town in Zimbabwe. And yeah. So you, you want me to talk about women in Motown? Is that uh, it? You, you, you talked about that woman who, um, yeah. who, who produced yeah. uh, Steve Wonder. Well, you know, the, I'm, I'm struck listening to you talk about uh, going to the museum and you know, being at the site of this music, you know. Uh, when we, you know, when we um, African-Americans go to Africa, we typically have a life-changing uh, experience, right, and, and feeling too, you know. Uh, we grew to appreciate uh, our African heritage, you know, and that, all this was a part of the, uh, the Motown era, this period of self-determination. Uh, and so, um, but it's interesting, you know, with your book that talks about the women's struggle in Zimbabwe uh, for artistic expression, you know. Um, there's a very important uh, woman who came uh, out of the Motown stables. She started as a, a songwriter, songwriter only, okay, because uh, the men believed that that's what girls do, right? You write songs, but you don't produce songs. You're not a producer. That's, that's what a boy does. Mm. Um, Sylvia Moy, right? The late Sylvia Moy. Okay. Mm. Sylvia became a producer because of, because of Stevie Wonder. Okay. Mm. And because of the work that she did with Stevie Wonder, mm. uh, Motown was given an extra life, you know, and a social political life right on up to the 1980s when Stevie Wonder. Uh, you know, he came out the bedroom and started singing serious things. You mm. might have the cash, but you can't cash <laughs> in your face. You mm. know, he's talking to, talking to the system in 1974, Nixon and them, you know. It's not too cool to be ridiculed, but you brought this upon yourself. Mm. Sounds like you're talking about Donald Trump, mm. you know. I mean, if you really, really want to know our view, you haven't done nothing, okay. Well, Sylvia got to be a producer because the men at Motown, I um, mean, there were um, there was a lot of sexist dudes there, okay, uh, uh, and they had their own ideas. Okay, when 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 uh, Stevie Wonder's voice changed, they wanted to ditch him and fire him. Can you imagine? He's like, That's, he's not cute anymore. Mm -hmm. Plus, he's singing these romantic songs, and he he wants to write his own songs. Mm -hmm. Well, Sylvia Moy uh, asked for a crack mm -hmm. at producing Stevie Wonder, mm -hmm. and what Sylvia did was. Uh, I mean, her, her method was to go to a, an artist's workroom and record everything they did mm. and produce and perfect from there, okay? Uh, Stevie Wonder's songs, you know, had a lot of words and mm. a lot of words and a full narratives and so forth. Very different, okay? A mo kind of Motown song. Mm. And Sylvia Moy uh, perfected his technique, okay? Uh, his famous uh, monster hit, My Sharia Moore, okay? Sylvia heard him uh, sing his early version of it was, you know, she said that Stevie Wonder, when he was a teenager, he fell in love every three or four weeks, right, and wrote love songs. Mm -hmm. My Sharia Moore uh, was originally called My Beloved Marsha, mm -hmm. you know, and she said, <laughs> she said, she said, we need more, you know, we need more to that, okay? Uh, but she tells this story wonderfully on film. There's a great film that the great jazz bassist Marion Hayden and Ben Lita, mm -hmm made, uh, Marion's also an educator. Well, Sylvia is talking about uh, her struggles with men, mm. you know, and she became just the first woman producer, right? But she went through, you know, hell coming through, okay? Uh, my Sharia Moore, she tells us, sat on the shelves in Motown for about eight months mm -hmm. because nobody knew what it meant. The men like, what? What are you doing, girl? What kind of language mm. is my Sharia? You know. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, Sylvia Moore was a, a, a very important person at Motown, and she worked herself into a position uh, to, uh, to be one of the Motown employees who got paid. Okay. Mm. It's good to have women, I mean, strong women in the music industry, because women are only seen maybe as singing. But to have producers is also very important. And yeah. Well, you know, we, we really don't have the African background, uh, African culture expressing itself uh, if woman is in the 
is in the dark somewhere. That's not the African heritage, you know what I mean? Woman's status has gone up and down. Uh, but this is a tradition that comes from strong women. You know, the spiritual song, Go Down Moses, mm -hmm. Harriet Tubman wrote that song. Mm -hmm. okay. Pre-colonial women in Africa were very strong. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it Absolutely. came after a lot of things happened, but we had a lot of strong women like Neander mm -hmm. and um, yeah. But then uh, while all this has been said and done, how do we keep this memory of Motown um, in Zimbabwe? It is important for us to keep the memory going. Um, I, I would like to, to, to encourage exchange uh, programs like this because Penny Stamps has uh, kept the memory of Motown going and um, uh, Zimbabwe uh, Cultural Center in Detroit and um, the Michigan Uni and Uni the University of Michigan and um, Dr. Melvin here is uh, documenting and that will keep um, the, 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 the memory going. And I think this is your next book. That's what you're yes, talking about. Yes, right. this is what I want to <laughs> right, say. Right, right. And people like Masha um, Battlefield Port, um, talking about family and the black bottom. I, I, I am an archivist myself, although I started uh, as a journalist as it, and other things, but I like archiving um, and documenting, writing books, document and producing film documentaries to document our, our, our history so that we, we, we keep it alive. And I, like, what, 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 I think you heard me saying, telling you what my friends said when I was coming here. And when I interviewed, when I talked to people here, some of them I said, were well, we brought up in the same house? So because our background was so similar. In the Motown, Harare, Bulawayo, mm -hmm. and you wonder, were we not brought up in the same house like mm -hmm. Masha, how his father felt about the music enter. Um, being a jazz musician, being a jazz uh, person who listened to jazz music as well. So I think it's so important for us to keep the memory. Mm -hmm. We can sit here and talk about it, but how, how are we going to keep the memory? When I talk to these people, I say to myself, I'm going to do a film documentary, and I'm going to write a book on, on, on Motown in Zimbabwe. In my small way of documenting, I have a, an, an, archi an archive museum called Joyce Jenji Makwenda, which is in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. and I really encourage documentation. So I think um, very soon... That, that, that will be an important book because it's... It's a cultural story, okay? mm -hmm. uh, it's a business story. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very important for the youth because mm -hmm. a lot of people think that uh, uh, blacks have no business kind of <laughs> tradition, you know, and it's a history that, uh, mm -hmm. that must be told, but that's how you keep things alive, you mm -hmm. know, you, you document them, you write them, mm -hmm. uh, and you teach them. Yes. Uh, you keep it taught. Mm -hmm. you know? Because if a book is written, then it can be taught in schools, it can be a resource. So uh, um, with those words, I come to the end of, we come to the end of our conversation with um, Dr. Melvin Peters. Thank you so much all for being here. And um, thank you, uh, Penny Stamp Series, for giving us this platform to keep the memory of Motown in Zimbabwe alive. Wow, love, and I don't know if you guys, we do have a few minutes before we have to move everything because we are going to have a jazz band that's going to follow this, it's going to happen outdoors. We have a few minutes, if you guys did want to ask some questions, we can do that.